either uh, distinctly about form uh, and, and also are not informal kind of things that give hint of shape. And armature is a term that historically uh, actually comes from sculpture, although urbanists like myself start to use it. Armature is kind of uh, like if you make a sculpture, oftentimes there's kind of a steel underpinning uh, that holds a clay sculpture together. So that's what an armature is. And so <clears throat> I traditionally talk about the work in terms of this idea of these kind of elements that contribute uh, to not just our practice, but everyone's, or at least I think so, these kind of, let's say, unseen or non-formal systems that result in shapes, uh, whether consciously or subconsciously, and then talk about the notion of <clears throat> materiality as one way of how we think of things, frameworks, meaning kind of government regulations and systems. But, <clears throat> okay, first, yeah, okay, so I'm in, uh, the Pearl River Delta currently in Hong Kong and our office is also in Shenzhen as well. But in reality, I come from a, <clears throat> originally an extremely small town uh, in the United States. It's a town of 1000 people. But even in a place like that, this notion of armatures and, and material was kind of present even as a child and I maybe didn't even realize it. You can see it here. It's the house I grew up in is one of these dots amongst these squares kind of the typical American middle landscape where the grid was laid out. And that grid exists, talking about the notion of frameworks, because the, uh, the American government <clears throat> as a way to settle or to take away the land from the Native Americans, they set a grid across the entire country. And this was a way for uh, settlers like my great, great, great grandparents to come and, and take land. But this legacy of this framework still exists and how I experienced the spaces growing up. In terms of systems, the reason my hometown even exists is because it's halfway between what is basically the Mississippi River and one of the Great Lakes, Lake Erie, and they established a canal to connect the two <clears throat> so that they would be able to uh, allow shipping uh, coming from Canada and going all the way down to Mexico through the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. So this manipulation of systems, in this case, canal uh, was something that is the only reason my hometown exists. And lastly, <clears throat> speaking of the, the Native American uh, reality in, in a place like the United States, my town is actually called Fort Lormy, uh, where I'm from. And it's called a fort because it was established in its time uh, at then the western edge of what was at that point the United States. And it was a, a fort that was set up to battle against the Native Americans that lived there. Uh, so we could take the land from them as, as the Americans did. But growing up, as you can see in this image here, that's a, an arrowhead, so a stone tip uh, that you would have as a pointy tip <clears throat> on an arrowhead. And when I grew up, it was extremely common because it was very much a farming community. And when you farm, you turn over the soil every year to get fresh soil. And because there were so many battles fought in my hometown uh, 200 years ago, it was very common to find these kind of Native American arrowheads everywhere. And most people like me as a young boy or young girl had a collection of these arrowheads just sitting around their houses. I had them on a shelf uh, next to my bed and many of them. So this notion of material that we talk about in architecture and urban design isn't just uh, a choice of material. It speaks about culture. It speaks about all sorts of legacies, but okay. Getting a, a bit more specific, the name of uh, the office is LCC or Land and Civilization Compositions. And yeah, that's me in the front. Uh, this was, I think about three years ago, uh, back when we could travel a bit more. And that's me uh, leaving Hong Kong and trying to enter Shenzhen. And there was something wrong at the border that day. So the line was particularly long. But the reason I show this photo is to emphasize <clears throat> in urban design, architecture, it's always a collaborative process. So I'll be speaking about our work or I'll maybe even say I or me, but in reality, this everything that is done here is in collaboration with other landscape architects, architects, technologists, government officials, developers, citizens. And so that's just a reality of the work. It's not a singular uh, sort of work. It's, it's very much a collaboration. Uh, in terms of as an office, uh, we are architects and urban designers. 
but we, we also are just really interested in cities and in culture and in landscapes. So we've done a number of things in the last 10 years with the office from making a documentary film, uh, looking at governmental power structures and how it relates to development in Turkey. In the Netherlands, where we used to be 10 years ago, uh, we started our own lecture series with some friends in reality in the back of a bar where we wanted to invite people who shape cities, but not just government officials or developers or architects, but also people who make food, uh, people who throw parties and have a discussion about what was then the future of Rotterdam at that point. Uh, we're also regular writers. Uh, we were one of the contributors to this uh, <clears throat> edition of AD Magazine, which Liam Young uh, guest edited. And we were one of the contributors talking about technology. This is something we start to talk about more and more as architects. And then finally, we, we do really like to make things with our hand. This is a, one of our first installations we did back in Rotterdam. I think that was about nine years ago at this point for the Rotterdam Biennale, where we took an industrial space that had a tradition of uh, working with fabric. And we made a series of installations where we <clears throat> played with that sort of fabric to give a different spatial condition to this existing industrial space as part of this kind of public space and interior event in the BNL. But okay, um, and forgive this graphic, I'll come back to it. Because again, really thanks to the Edo and, and the team uh, there in Torino for inviting me because <clears throat> in the back of my head, I've been trying to think about how our work relates to traditional notions of urban design that I was taught and still to be honest, teach at Hong Kong University at HKU and how I think some of our projects start to point to how maybe there's something changing in the reality of urban design. And we can start to not dismiss these traditional notions, but start to question them and what they mean in the 21st century, and perhaps particularly within the Asian uh, reality, whether in the cities or even in the countryside. And at the last there, I'll talk, because yeah, I'm doing a PhD, a bit about how this relates to materiality in a few cases, or or detailing or the object uh, as part of a larger sort of system. But with that, I'll dig into it. First, we'll start with this notion of infrastructure ideas and transit oriented development, which is something that's talked about a lot uh, these days. And what I see more is, as I'll call deep networks. So my first job uh, 20 years ago, I worked for an office called uh, Calthorpe Associates, which was headed by Peter Calthorpe. He, to be honest, actually invented the term transit-oriented development. So we did a great deal of these sort of projects when I was there 20 years ago back in California. Maybe the most well-known perhaps besides his books, which are probably more well-known was we took what used to be the Denver airport and turned it into a series of mixed use communities. This is very much an American form. So maybe you could say it's a better suburb uh, but thinking about <clears throat> transit networks and environment, environmental networks. But when I start to reflect on that idea of how we related to transit-oriented development and systems then, I think my thinking on it has started to shift in terms of opportunities. And part of that is because, again, working here within this reality and the changing nature of technology. So to discuss that, uh, we were part of a initial competition win uh, for a series of public spaces in Tianhai. Tianhai is in the western part of Shenzhen, uh, a new CBD, and is still very much growing. <clears throat> uh, you can see a picture here. This is from two years ago. Very high density skyscrapers, uh, a lot of uh, transit networks flowing through, and a bunch of very provocative buildings going up by a series of star architects from within China and from abroad. But we were asked to actually do a very small part uh, you can see here just a, a series of linear parks that had a great deal of infrastructure running below because Tianhai is very focused on being extremely connected in terms of transit <clears throat> and having many layers. So when we first were asked about uh, this for the competition, thinking about these spaces, we didn't just think about the park themselves. We wanted to understand obviously the urban design context, the massing, the uses, also doing some understanding of wind and environmental conditions that result from the coming buildings <clears throat> and how this could relate to those public spaces. And then the big idea we brought uh, was that got us a lot of attention was this term uh, biotopes, which really just means a kind of plant habitat. 
and we suggested in the greater Bay Area or Pearl River Delta, there's a great deal of plant diversity. And we wanted to take some of those iconic sort of habitats and bring them into a very urban condition uh, within uh, Tianhai. And we wanted to talk about how we could mingle them with uh, some of the infrastructural realities above ground and below to give a different character. Moving forward, I mean, we start to think about how these areas break up into a series of themes and types of ecologies. We start to look at these types of biotopes or ecologies and how they go from more natural and maybe uh, habitats that maybe humans shouldn't touch very much to something we even said an idea of a man-made or urban biotope and started to set up these ideas of how these habitats could grow and exist within this place. And then we start to deploy them within each area thinking about how a play space could mix with a certain habitat to how we could have more of a gathering space and how these could start to come together. These are the initial competition vendors for how we could have something more like a wetland mixed in in a high density area to much more of a, as it says, a jungle sort of character right in the middle of the city coming out of that into something much more urban in terms of a shade structure and cooling pool area. So you can see a few of these transitions possible in this urban habitat. Culminating in this sort of collection of spaces here, <clears throat> as you can see again in the, the rendering for the competition. But then again, taking this idea of habitats or biotopes, uh, there were a series of pedestrian bridges required uh, in this area. We thought of these pedestrian bridges as we wanted them to be like, you may have seen uh, animal bridges uh, more in rural areas that allow uh, deer or, or wild animals to cross over highways. We wanted the bridges themselves to feel like those animal crossings for the humans themselves to kind of interconnect these biotopes. But further, uh, we wanted to think about how those uh, ecologies could come down to, yeah, these are the lower levels, the reality of all the infrastructure underneath our space, uh, whether it's train stations, shopping malls, things of these varieties, how could we start to bring that feeling there uh, being in most transit or underground systems, it can be quite dark, literally, and not so, uh, well, it just doesn't feel like you're connected to the outside world. So how could we start to fold down uh, some of these habitats to provide light? Uh, how can we literally bring it down in a simple way so the access from above and below also gives you an experience as you descend a staircase to a lower space? And then even more nicely, which the idea came from our, our Chinese LDI architect partner, which was fantastic, suggested the reality is this infrastructure is being built now, but <clears throat> Tianhai is slowly going to build and be filled over the next 10 to 20 years, depending on timeline. But this massive piece of infrastructure that's being built actually will be not so fully used for the next 10 years and have lots of extra space. So how could we use that infrastructure, maybe not even just for ecology, but also for events. Could we have a fashion show there? Maybe even basketball. Could we have uh, the Shenzhen Biennale uh, be in this sort of space to use infrastructure as a temporary opportunity? And then we also even thought of the infrastructure a bit, and I'll talk about this in a few projects, uh, as a bit trying to relate to natural systems in terms of form. We wanted the place where you would come out of the tunnel to really feel like, almost like you're coming out of a cave. And this gets to this last uh, thing that I said I'll mention a few times, this idea on materiality and culture. And I have a line there on the left that says a brick wants to be a brick, which is a, a Louis Kahn quote. And I'm in no way trying to question Louis Kahn. But as we start to think about our work, <clears throat> we start to think about how the materiality or the spatial conditions can relate to even bigger uh, issues and can relate to the idea that maybe material isn't just like a brick and we see it as it will stay that way forever and stay fixed, but that it evolves. And so in this, as I mentioned, this idea of biotopes and layers, we thought about these moments when you would come out of the tunnel <clears throat> from the train, come up onto an elevated pedestrian bridge, overlook a park designed by field operations who also did the master plan, by the way. And you would have a sense through these biotopes and habitats of being connected to the greater Bay Area. You wouldn't just be in Tianhai. You wouldn't <clears throat> just be in a park. You would feel part of the entire greater Bay Area. <clears throat> now, moving on to the next kind of 
pretty normal urban design discussion. I talked about trans transit oriented development. And since we have the Italians <clears throat> in the room, I thought talking about uh, the figure ground or this <clears throat> very iconic drawing of Rome, uh, which is a classic in urban design and should be because <clears throat> it starts to suggest the notion of uh, what is public space, uh, what is building and how courtyards and streets start to work together. But I start to wonder <clears throat> within the Asian reality or even in old cities, if it's as clear and black and white as this plan by Noli, by the way, or drawing by Noli, I should say, <clears throat> if it's as distinctly public and private as this drawing suggests. A lot of experiences in Asia are much more layered in terms of public space being three-dimensional or also even a blur from public to private in many cases. And in that, again, I'll talk about an old project, <clears throat> and this is before I started the office, so this is not, uh, I was the project leader, uh, but a project we were doing then in the center of Rotterdam, where we were asked to do the uh, master plan and urban design for the cent new central station in Rotterdam. And so there were skyscrapers coming, which this is in Asia, Rotterdam has some skyscrapers, skyscrapers, but nothing like Guangzhou or, or Shenzhen or Hong Kong. And we talked about public spaces and all these things. But we started to bring up the idea that <clears throat> in this urban design strategy for Rotterdam Central Station, we should start to think of the public space, not just about what's on the ground, <clears throat> but elevated public spaces. One, how public space often includes in some ways the interior of the building. If it's a civic building or even a retail place, it can often feel a part of public space. And the potential to suggest that maybe rooftop bars, or community spaces could be on top of the skyscrapers themselves. The so public space is not just on the ground. Spaces like this, this is a, a real place in Los Angeles, start to behave like a public space. And we should start to think about that in terms of urban designers. <clears throat> Further on this project, because it's next to the train station of Rotterdam, there were a lot of uh, challenges because the train tracks kind of cut the city into a series of pieces. We talked about the ability with elevated public space to reconnect. <clears throat> and then, uh, nothing to do with the office I was at then, another office by the name of ZUS, Zonas Urbanas Sensibilis, uh, which has gone on to become more well known and does very nice work. And actually, I worked at for a short period of time. <clears throat> they said, hey, we can, we can build this elevated public space right now. And so they, through a series of crowdfunding, built this uh, pedestrian bridge that connected over top of the train tracks to an elevated garden and built a space literally through their building. Their office is in this building. Central Station is back here. So this space, this elevated pedestrian way, started to take form even before the master plan itself happened, because we did the master plan in about 2007, so just before the financial crisis hit the Netherlands very hard. But these other architects and urban designers <clears throat> took the initiative and made this happen in another way. And another interesting side note to this is they didn't just build the pedestrian network. <clears throat> they started to reprogram the space in what used to be a parking lot behind the building and was actually a pretty dangerous place. When I first got to Rotterdam about 15 years ago, it was a place to get illegal drugs, uh, maybe prostitution. These sort of things <clears throat> were happening in this. But they started to program the space with events, places to eat. And within five years, I actually happened to be out of the country at the time. I was in Ecuador watching the Dutch play football. And <clears throat> they cut to uh, the Dutch celebrating because they scored a goal. And they showed this space that five years earlier had been a complete dangerous spot that you would never go in the city at night. <clears throat> now this was on ESPN all over the world as a symbol of the Dutch celebrating because it was packed with people. It became one of the more exciting places to hang out in Rotterdam for sure. <clears throat> and then years went by, the, the train station uh, was completed. Uh, the queen of the Netherlands showed up uh, to cut the ribbon for the new train station. But what was also interesting is that spirit of playing around with heights of different layers of public space doing something a bit temp temporary and experimental stayed. The Rotterdam government <clears throat> started a fund that you could apply to suggest ideas for temporary sort of public space events. And this was actually designed by MVRDV, 
Uh, so not just a small time office, but a very famous and very connected office within the Netherlands proposed to make a massive stair to go from the, the main plaza to the top of one of the more iconic buildings in the Netherlands to treat this as a public space and a, create a series of elevated public spaces. So this sort of evolved from <clears throat> a master plan idea, someone else picked it up and interpreted it another way and then the government saw it another way and then another designer picked it up and saw it another way. So these cities evolve, but the notion that public space is layered and not just on the ground persisted. Coming to, <clears throat> this is a competition we did recently, I think about a year and a half ago with an office called MLA Plus and another office with my friend Eugene based in Shenzhen. Uh, as you can see, Atelier Architecture, <clears throat> Alternative Architecture, excuse me. Uh, we submitted this. We ended up, to be honest, not winning the competition. I believe in the end, I believe Zaha won. MVRDV was one of the finalists. But the call was for space right at the border of Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Huanggang, right at the border. Uh, the area has always been a border checkpoint. Uh, traditionally, in the 90s, when it was opened as a main checkpoint, it was more about trucking. Uh, and shipping to go through. <clears throat> in the last years, it's been a main crossing point for humans uh, and the, the kind of shipping reality stays. But in the future, they wanted to look how this space could be kind of a special district or almost a high-tech campus. And the call was for an urban design strategy for that. So the client, <clears throat> because they really want a high-tech campus, they want to draw uh, both from the, the kind of talent base of Shenzhen, as well as the international or however you want to see it of Hong Kong and connecting these two. But they wanted to celebrate in the urban design these technological advances. So it became a question for us of how to incorporate, the, incorporate these into 3D contemporary urban design. First of all, it, Hong Kong is a, is a border with many people crossing uh, very complex flows of individuals, cars, trucks, uh, trains moving <clears throat> and how to start to deal with these sort of reality of what is now a place where you need a visa or, or a passport to cross, but will, will not be in 20 or so years. How to formalize these and deal with the realities of these sort of spaces. How do you still create a great city uh, in a kind of border crossing? <clears throat> and so one example here is this is actually uh, one of the entrances uh, you would have on the south uh, coming up from a lowered space, opening up into a nice plaza and series of terrace spaces. We also were challenged with the idea of thinking of this future-oriented workspace, as they said. Setting up a series of principles uh, that deal with some of the ideas I think we all hear about in terms of working, in terms of a more collective space, flexibility, these being high-tech uh, spaces, they need a bigger core for the potential over time of sort of wires and and air cooling uh, systems that would need to come in and how that could be broken up into a series of different building typologies to accommodate what are a decent variety of innovation companies and how those result into maybe more playful architectural forms as well because of course those sort of systems require uh, a certain series of realities uh, for working but also in terms of the hubs and how they could both provide a bit of identity in terms of more iconic buildings in some places, but still a cohesiveness that relates to the city of Shenzhen as it is. Then smart campus, again, smart city, these technologies, how do you take <clears throat> these elements like smart light poles, self-sorting trash, uh, energy grid, and start to make them into something more? For us, what we saw as an opportunity is those buildings, those, excuse me, technologies, need uh, a lot of space for data collection. So we could use collective buildings that could house those sort of systems and use those as kind of community spaces as well as spaces for storage and data and could allow us to have a few buildings with a different character, maybe not as oriented to traditional office work, but being more object buildings uh, within. Sustainability, this is thinking more about <clears throat> a logistics uh, waste and how these could be leveraged, how these systems come together and what are the opportunities. So not just to be efficient, but how to make something special. So we suggested uh, because it's along the Shenzhen River, but because of the border reality, no one would be, ever be allowed to touch the Shenzhen River. So having a, a pool sort of beach like space that would be heated or cooled 
through these district heating and cooling systems adjacent so people could still play in the water uh, without causing any issue in terms of border conditions. And then the campus itself, which is more, if I'm honest with the client, is focused on. This is a, a tricky area. You can see here, again, Hong Kong is to the south, Shenzhen is to the west. Generically speaking, if you think of Shenzhen Bay or Deep Bay, Shenzhen is more urbanized uh, to the north. Hong Kong has remained more rural or, or more natural to the south. And this area is a key habitat for migrating birds from Southeast Asia coming north and vice versa. So how to accommodate bird habitat was a key question. So the master plan starts to come together here. I'll break it into a series of pieces. So we start to break it into a series of layers, thinking about water systems, pedestrian flows, ground floor retail and how it comes together. This is kind of the exo of the project base with the, the above 10 meters ripped off the top. So just the base kind of human uh, street level, eye level experience one would have, where we started <clears throat> by thinking of how we could divert an existing river that used to go around the site and bring part of the flow into the site to create this sort of, as we called the project, this innovation delta. So to allow these small scale uh, sort of systems to clean the water, collect the water and provide a series of spaces, both for plants, but also for humans, how they could provide a different series of spaces for the workers to step outside of their building, hang out and relax uh, of different characters, some more urban, some more meditative as we called, but to have a space like this in a high density urban campus that at moments would feel quite naturalistic at the base, but above would still feel high tech and these feeling kind of adjacent to each other. Moving further, despite this kind of overall idea of wanting it to feel uh, like a Delta, uh, in terms of urban, uh, we still wanted a clear framework for other sort of uses in terms of food, uh, kind of working spaces, exercise. <clears throat> so actually at the base, there is a, a pretty classic sort of grid uh, set within the project, broken up into a series of themes. So one street is really seen as this kind of double layered sports street uh, with an elevated walkway for jogging uh, and exercise uh, up above uh, with the street below, places to uh, get a bit of exercise while you're working. You can see a bit of an illustration here. Uh, then there was also the kind of cultural block or street that was a mix of exhibition spaces uh, event spaces, as well as an outdoor uh, sort of sculpture garden of technology. And then a central spine uh, down the middle, uh, kind of a main street, shall we say, that focused on how to create a series of small scale collective spaces that were actually outside of offices. So if I worked at a tech office and I wanted to meet my friend who worked at a different tech office, we could meet together <clears throat> and see about maybe other ideas we have. Maybe we try and start our own company or maybe our companies try and collaborate to create a series of spaces like this, a bit more informal along this spine. And thanks to notions of self-driving cars and things like this, the street could feel quite open and free flowing in terms of its character, but still relate to traditional ideas of a, let's say a grand avenue. And coming together in a series of spaces like this. So an array of typologies in terms of uh, exercise and building uh, coming together to form this sort of layered uh, space within the innovation delta. So <clears throat> moving to the next, excuse me, very classic urban design discussion. Uh, there's this notion of image of the city and I think of it more as new interfaces as a potential. Image of the city is a book written by a guy named Kevin Lynch uh, who did a lot of analysis and writing about how we see and read the city he wrote a lot of things, but image of the city, he broke down how you perceive <clears throat> the city through a series of components, landmarks, which in a traditional place might be seen as a church or a government building, uh, the kind of edge uh, that you might have to a certain district, pathways, and key nodes and hubs. But they're all very visual based and very much based on form. I'm not suggesting that these uh, realities don't still exist. But I think uh, with the interface we have with the city data and information, the way we read the city, the way we see it is not strictly based on uh, buildings and streets, uh, the way Lynch spoke about it, at least in my opinion. 
So in, in an attempt to relate to that <clears throat> um, is another project we have ongoing is called the Shenzhen Bay uh, Waterfront Park. It's a 10 linear kilometer park all along Deep Bay or Shenzhen Bay. And uh, <clears throat> the, of course, Shenzhen, you know, 40, uh, Shenzhen is actually younger than I am. I'm 44. Uh, Shenzhen, I think, is 41 now, or maybe 40. And so this city has obviously grown very rapidly. I mean, similar to many Chinese cities, of course, but Shenzhen was a series of smaller scale villages previously and is rapidly urbanized. But in doing so, it's really gone from a waterfront edge uh, that used to be small scale local uh, villages to something extremely urban. So you can see over time here, Shenzhen, uh, the, the park we're gonna deal with is along this old edge. This is Deep Bay, this is Hong Kong. Shanghai that I mentioned before is over here. You can start to see how they start to fill in the water <clears throat> uh, with land, land, land with land reclamation, with land reclamation around. And so the, the park is kind of a new series of uh, public spaces that already exist, uh, interfacing from the very urban realities of places like Nanshan and Futian, and this park sort of space here. So one, we talked about <clears throat> trying to be aware of that history, uh, that the bay itself has moved. Uh, the waterfront has shifted over time from the 90s to 2000s to what it is now, being aware of that. And being aware that historically there was more of a blur between what was maybe a human habitat, what was maybe uh, a plant-based habitat and what was water. But now it becomes really a straight line between these sort of areas, a series of stripes. And we wanted to strive on how we could start to blur uh, the reality between the water, the urban, and the plant. But in doing this, we have to be aware of uh, the reality of water itself. This is not just uh, a bay. Uh, there is water flowing out from rivers, water flowing out from pipes, and this dramatically affects the water quality and ecological conditions of the waterfront spaces themselves and what can grow and what could be the quality of those spaces for humans, as well as the reality of how one can access this. Most of the site is bound by either a freeway or actually a large uh, transport hub uh, in this area. And so what are the accessibility situations for humans in terms of usually overpasses, transit hubs, things like this. And then we wanted to start to think about, as we start to get aware of this water strategy, we obviously have to be aware of the tidal conditions there are. This is a tidal sort of space and what that means <clears throat> for the habitat below and how it could relate to a series of public spaces. So we start to look at each neighborhood in this, I mean, this is a massive area, as I said, kind of linear, uh, about 10 linear kilometers with very different conditions in terms of how it relates. The new Shenzhen Opera House that was won by Jean Nouvel will go on this space. There's a new wetland museum uh, that they haven't announced the winner on, which is in this space. Residential community, Shenzhen Bay Super Headquarters is coming in here. The conditions along the waterfront are very different. So to understand these neighborhoods, we started to think of a series of, as we call them, programmatic platforms, a series of public spaces that could actually relate to the water itself. So starting to think about the potential of something like floating farms or even a floating forest to allow uh, humans to actually be a part of the waterfront, literally. But then further, uh, we started to think about what that could mean for the plant life and fish life below. More and more as uh, citizens uh, and as urban designers, we have to be aware of ecology, but how these sort of spaces impact what is below and what that habitat is. We can't just say everything is a wetland now. It's a very, very diverse array of species and how we can help to foster a better waterfront ecology and human experience by being more aware of what's below the surface of the water. So through having a different uh, series of interventions or spaces, we could diversify the ecological waterfront of that <clears throat> uh, space to allow humans and animals to have a very different series of habitats along to add to the waterfront experience. But of course we still have, it's still an urban waterfront. To be honest, I'm not gonna talk about too much about the park spaces themselves, but there are you know, a linear walkway, a, a nice space to sit outside in the shade, 
uh, sporting uh, area that's part on the water, uh, part pulled back. This is a view looking towards Hong Kong, uh, an amphitheater next to the Shenzhen Bay Super Headquarters for performances, and even uh, the potential of a floating pool really within the bay itself, uh, kind of in a corner uh, by the Innovation Park, if you happen to know where that is. But then what this made us start to think, again, a bit similar to what I talked about with the biotope uh, idea uh, with the project in Tianhai, thinking about the spatialization and materiality. <clears throat> how could we think of these small scale habitats that we would generate? How could we make it so that when humans usually go to a waterfront anywhere in the world, they basically just stare out at uh, the beautiful water and maybe the sun and the sky in the distance and that's lovely. But we're often very unaware of the ecology and systems that are below, unless maybe we go out for a swim and have our feet uh, below and we feel a rock or we feel some sand or we feel a plant or maybe a fish bumps into us. But we're pretty unaware of that. And since this area has now been called not just the Pearl River Delta, but the Greater Bay Area, we wanted people to be aware of this notion of being connected to the Greater Bay Area when they look out over this space. And how could we create a series of, let's say, almost plaza or small scale interventions that would remind people of the kind of dynamic reality of the waterfront and of the city itself that could allow people uh, to kind of be informed using mostly digital technology uh, to have an awareness and an experience that would give them a greater sense of connection to the region and to the water systems themselves. And this is something, yeah, this is a diagram uh, that we collected together. So again, how do we make people in a very small scale sitting on a plaza, just sitting on a bench, how do we maybe have them have a bit of a, uh, an image of the city that is beyond what they can see right now, but almost makes them aware that they're connected by water, by train, by air to the entire Greater Bay Area uh, and the systems that accompany it. Uh, moving to the next, uh, being aware of citizens, of course, is a big part of urban design, uh, what, what the user is and what they want. In terms of urban design discourse, this is uh, Jane Jacobs. Uh, she's was, I should say, she's passed away a few years ago, was an American uh, writer and very influential uh, in uh, New York City, particularly in Manhattan and the West Village. Being against uh, the development that was happening then, mostly in the 60s and 70s, uh, where a great deal of infrastructure was coming through and perhaps threatening the quality of those neighborhoods. And she was one of the best uh, advocates for the idea of speaking to the people, understanding what is going on in the neighborhood instead of just doing urban design and grand master plans, what do the people actually want? And in, in regards to that, uh, Edo mentioned that I was a part of uh, the Shenzhen Biennale, I guess now five years ago, maybe six, five, uh, where we started this uh, thing called the A-Formal Academy, uh, where we, we took architects and worked with local craftsmen, or you could just say local construction workers, to make a series of objects and also collaborated with students and artists to start to make small scale installations. Uh, this is close to Shoko. Uh, that's actually the new, the master plans by OMA and this building is now the Shoko uh, ferry station. So if you come from Hong Kong or uh, some of the other parts of the Pearl River Delta, you arrive at that station, which is now complete. But we started to want to engage with this idea of community in a different way with our A-formal academy. Uh, and, and again, as I mentioned, we like to make things. So what could we make at a small scale to kind of be aware of uh, the notion of a tradition of maybe saunas and a, a mixing of tea traditions and a sauna tradition by these two artists here, uh, one of American descent and one is Austrian, along with actually that's our Airbnb host uh, who was kind enough to join in uh, this kind of tea spa experience in the middle of a construction site. We made a book about that. But coming back to more contemporary projects, uh, we were recently asked uh, in Hong Kong, uh, there's obviously a very dense, dense, dense urban center uh, where I generally live. I live in Sim Chai in Kowloon. But on the edge of Hong Kong, there's kind of a, a series of very rural uh, villages that still exist uh, in many ways. Uh, with oftentimes a, more elderly citizens. Uh, usually there's maybe a hiking path, not even a road. And because of the virus in the last year, 
uh, many urban folks in Hong Kong like myself, uh, since we can't really leave Hong Kong, start to look for things to do on the weekend and we go for hikes. So we go to these rural areas and suddenly these uh, kind of small communities uh, that are uh, a bit simple uh, in a very nice way and connected with nature suddenly have a lot of people hiking around, people wanting uh, to get a beer, or people wanting to get a snack, people maybe even wanting to stay somewhere. And so just before that, we were asked to do a community engagement project in a series of these communities. And so we set up a timeline initially, again, we were given the commission just before the virus hit. So we had this idea of how we'd work with the community and we'd have a series of public meetings and all these things. And then the virus hit. And then the ability to actually have a public engagement process during the virus had to shift. It had to get much more personal and much more small scale and had to use things like we're using now, online platforms of how we can start to identify community, which for us makes us question the traditional notion of community in urban design. Oftentimes it's assumed it's about the residents that live there, but in reality, the idea of community is much bigger <clears throat> than only the people that live there. It's kind of a gradient from those that live there as well as others that visit at times. And just to be clear where this place is, as I said, I'm kind of here in Kowloon, this is central, but this is uh, from Taiyo, if you happen to know where that is in Hong Kong, to Tung Chung. Uh, this is the airport. So it was a trail that went along uh, Northwest uh, Lantau Island, as Shenzhen to the north. So very series of small communities. I mean, a place like Shamwat, I think has a population of 100 people at most uh, living in its village. And some of the others, I think Tung Chung maybe goes up to 200, but quite small series of communities. And so in terms of doing community engagement, it's different than it used to be. We're able to use big data. So it's not just uh, uh, talking to people who happen to show up at a meeting. You can start to uh, do information technology, gathering via Google to understand what people take photos of, uh, get a sense of events and, and uh, use kind of geotagging in terms of environmental systems. You can start to use these systems to analyze historical maps and aerial photos to get a better understanding of how the area has evolved. This can lead to biodiversity systems, again, understanding habitats, starting to understand the peaks in terms of usage relating to festivals and seasons. The notion of site analysis is massive uh, in terms of potentials these days. But that was kind of the big data. Then there's the reality of the community engagement. So there's the small scale. Uh, both of these pictures are in Shamwat, uh, kind of dealing with the local community, meeting with the local leaders, uh, meeting with their oftentimes grandkids and having conversations, inviting uh, uh, cultural experts or environmental experts. This is Gavin who I teach with at HKU and Landscape to get their insights in terms of the ecological realities or cultural realities that maybe even the locals themselves don't understand. And being able to do a lot of that online allowed us to have a bigger sense of community, <clears throat> but also still wanting to be playful. Uh, this is a place that's visited uh, by people who maybe only come once a month or once every three months to set up a kind of game so they could quickly give us their feedback on what they wish could be in the area and get a sense of <clears throat> what this overall community might want uh, in the future. And even hiring a, a series of our friends who are illustrators to meet with passerbys and maybe ask them what they want and start to sketch in a spatial way of what they wish certain spaces along the pathway might want to be in the future. And we start to build this up in terms of a community engagement process through games, uh, through conversations, through online uh, surveys, we start to build up a whole idea of how we start to understand an idea of community engagement. Because in the end, they really wanted us, and we worked with an NGO and the government, what they wanted was a master plan. And, and we kind of told them, we don't think that's really what you want. What you really want is kind of a tool book or a playbook uh, for NGOs, designers, community members to collaborate in the future to make a series of small scale improvements. They don't want big infrastructure. They don't want huge changes, but they do have a series of interventions that could happen. And how could we start to set up a guide on what would make sense to be respect to the environment, what cultural heritage could be of value and what sort of spaces maybe offer opportunities. So we set up a series of typologies 
themes of each area that could be ways to emphasize and think about because in the future the government is offering actually in the future they're offering now uh, grants or, or subsidies or funding for these institutions to start proposing <clears throat> changes in the area working with the local community and so we start to set up the frameworks for how let's say small scale urban design or public space or community buildings could be uh, built within the area. And then again, shifting back to this notion of materiality uh, relating to something else our office did, because if I'm honest, our office is actually uh, talking to an NGO, talking to one of the communities about potentially doing a project in the area, but that's very much in process. But it related to a uh, speculation we did uh, about four years ago, no, three years ago. The typhoon uh, Mangat hit uh, Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Guangzhou quite hard, uh, but in Hong Kong it, and Shenzhen as well, it knocked down a massive, a massive amount of trees uh, were damaged. <clears throat> and what was shocking to us was basically, I can't speak to the Shenzhen government, we didn't look into that, but the Hong Kong government was basically just throwing away the trees. They were collecting them, piling them on what is the Hong Kong former airport site and massive piles of wood, and then actually putting it in a, in a dump site or a land waste, which looks at Shenzhen, by the way, and just throwing away the wood. So we started to suggest, hey, uh, wood is a beautiful opportunity. <clears throat> uh, it's a very useful product. Uh, this typhoon is gonna keep happening in a place like Hong Kong, especially with climate change. This is gonna be a significant reality over and over. So this will happen again. Could we set up a different way of collection points, or shall we say recycling points for these fallen trees to offer them to some of the edge communities of Hong Kong as a way that they could have, let's say, free material to build things. Could be something simple as grinding up the wood to use on playgrounds to make a soft surface in case you fall. But <clears throat> relating to the project I was talking about before uh, along the Tungo Trail is could we set up uh, small spaces along these communities where perhaps they could build themselves a better boardwalk along the waterfront, perhaps a pier. Some people are still doing small scale fishing. Could they maybe make boats? Could they build community centers? How could we take this kind of wood that the government is throwing away and see it as a kind of free gift to give back to the locals? And in terms of materiality, one, we think the potential of something like this could raise kind of have the reminding people of the reality of typhoons and even of climate change. But also, you know, Hong Kong is now kind of all concrete and steel. But in reality, in terms of these sort of spaces and these traditions, most of the buildings were built of wood. Uh, and, and can we start to think of that uh, material heritage and culture as something that can be designed in a, in a new way, doesn't need to be strictly historical, but that tradition of working with wood could be a potential for these communities. Okay. Uh, next step is the idea of programming and mixed use, or as we think of it more as a dynamic use. So on this, uh, this project uh, was actually kind of how the office for us in Shenzhen and Hong Kong really got moving, a park in, in Guangming in Shenzhen. The government had a competition. Uh, we, along with Lola Landscape Architects and Taller Architects, who we work with a great deal, uh, entered the competition, we were lucky enough to win. <clears throat> but the call from the government uh, really basically just said, because it's kind of a, a beautiful site in Guangming, which is a growing part of Shenzhen. It's in Northwest Shenzhen, as you can kind of see here, the kind of core of Shenzhen, Futian and Nanshan, Baowan are here with Luohu here, but Guangming is up here. Uh, it's along uh, the high speed rail line that goes from uh, Hong Kong to Guangzhou. The first stop when you go from Hong Kong is in Futian and Shenzhen, but the next one is Guangming. It's about 500 meters from this park site. Uh, but it was part of a larger network, uh, an entire ecology going really from the waterfront and even heading up towards uh, Guangzhou. <clears throat> and the client, the government really just said, hey, we want a nature and a sports park. You know, there's hills nice place to go for a hike and there's a flat part that's more related to our growing city uh how about some sport which we understood but we wanted to question that in terms of other opportunities so you can see the site here like said pretty clearly to the east uh, kind of very much like Shenzhen or Hong Kong or parts of Guangzhou very 
hilly to the east, uh, pretty much untouched with a few hiking paths, the train line zipping through, and then the growing city of, or the district of Guangming to the west in this existing sort of uh, water area. So we proposed uh, this sort of space here, which I'll dive into a bit more. Our first idea was, yeah, if you know about uh, natural spaces, it's not, you actually have a series of very different ecologies if, if it's planted and, and taken care of well in this sort of place with a series of different heights. Uh, on top of the hills versus down in the water spaces, there's a, there's a great deal of animal and plant life you could see. <clears throat> and so we thought, one, could we make it uh, so one could experience that pretty easily? And two, I mean, I'm in pretty good shape for a 40 year old guy, but a lot of young kids, a lot of older people, a lot of people who maybe have a physical disability, it becomes very tough to go hiking up a hill. Uh, so they can't maybe experience that, like maybe someone in really good shape in their 20s or 30s. How could we handle that? And we jokingly said, uh, let's make a ramp from the bottom to the top uh, at grade so you could take a wheelchair or walk at a very comfortable pace uh, all the way from the bottom to the top. And at one point we started to take ourselves seriously and said, okay, uh, we make this kind of curving red path uh, that's gonna be about four kilometers long, linking all the way from the bottom to the top. And then we use that kind of red path to create a series of moments along the way. And these moments could frame different sort of experiences. Some, you know, would be very small and kind of cutting through nature to allow you that kind of intimate moment uh, with the landscape that I mentioned. Uh, we could have a tower element above, kind of at the top, so you could look back and look over the area, uh, kind of like you saw in the render view. But kind of small moments that slice through uh, this sort of red path could be there, as well as, you know, at moments it could open up at offering great views back to the city of Xinjiang and the area of Guangming in and of itself and the lake area you can kind of see, as well as smaller areas can we create <clears throat> almost like let's say pavilions or little playful moments with the reality of this to kind of have you wrap around a tree as you descend from an elevated path that become a bit uh, formal in character. We could also form uh, information booth uh, underneath a kind of amphitheater. <clears throat> and you can see here it connects across the main street. There was a talk of having these play spaces, as I said, so basketball, tennis, skate park, these sort of uh, more formal uh, play spaces to the west. <clears throat> and these, as you can tell, uh, the first phase of the project is built. This is the shot of it at night. Uh, it's been very popular. We're quite happy uh, with its success. Um, for phase one, uh, the choice to make it red was extremely popular uh, during spring festival. Uh, many folks came and, and wanted to spend time and been well received. So we're moving on to phase two now of the project. Uh, and as you can see here in a render, this is again the kind of west area that's more urban. Uh, this is the reality of what's actually built now. And we're going to start to move to phase two, which is kind of in the middle around this uh, existing reservoir that will become a, a public lake. And then we started to, for this, it wasn't just about the red path and these ecologies, it was about, we also really pushed, and this is why I speak of the notion of program uh, and mixed use and things like this. We said, hey, uh, this is Shenzhen. Uh, Shenzhen's really proud to be innovative and high tech. Let's not treat this just as sports or just as leisure. Let's really celebrate uh, the fact that Shenzhen wants to be innovative and high tech. So let's, let's look at sports, uh, especially in a place like Asia, become much more uh, diverse than just basketball or football or tennis or whatever. How can we start to think about the many types of sports and the technologies that come with them? And could we even create kind of a research and development area for kind of new sports? <clears throat> and also in a smaller scale note, I mean, coming from the West, if you build a basketball court, people play basketball on it. You build a tennis court, people play tennis on it. But here in, in East Asia, if you build a basketball court in the morning, people probably are doing Tai Chi on it. And uh, the late morning, maybe kids are playing around with their mother or father at lunch, people might be eating. In the afternoon, maybe some folks are hanging out as young couples. And maybe in the evening, a few people are playing basketball. And then later at night, maybe it's a place to hang out. So these 
what we started to call multi-fields acknowledge that over time, these public space sports facilities are not just used for one sport, but many. So we developed these kind of idea of multi-fields. So playing around with how we could mix uh, yeah, cycling and running into a track that could be used in different ways at different times, played with the idea of quote ball sports, what sort of ball sports could we think about? And so we did the initial concept for this and now we're heading into phase two. Now, the reason I show a, a pretty typical zoning map <clears throat> is because again, in urban design, the notion of mixed use is often talked about and rightfully so. So the idea of having retail maybe more at the center and office and business next to it and more high density residential and kind of having a mix of uses. But what we think we pushed a bit in this project was why can't the park itself be a place for innovation? Why can't it be a place for culture? It's not just a park. It's also programmed. It's also mixed use over time throughout the day, just like the more urban assumptions uh, that we have traditionally in urban design. And then relating again to this notion of materiality and how we can think about that in terms of innovation, we didn't just think of it in terms of the sport, but also in terms of ecology. Because yes, the area is still a natural place, but actually the ecological quality that's there is quite mediocre at best. So we started to point out <clears throat> what are now pretty standard planting realities, how over time we could diversify the park in different areas with different planting decisions and, and animal species, and that could happen over time. And then we've put forward and seems to be like it's gonna to happen to really put a natural research and development center or kind of greenhouse really within the park itself where visitors could visit, but also um, <clears throat> scientists themselves could really uh, be a part of being there and, and, and really do sort of tests on what sort of plants could be a part of this park in the future. And then in time, those sort of that hub of an R&D center that's within this space could start to suggest the kind of plants that could go out in the park. But even beyond just that greenhouse itself, this kind of looping space that is around the park has a different series of topography or slopes. And those slopes allow for a different kind of animal species along the way. And if you know anything about parks, Usually when you design a park, you go to an or a garden, you go to a nursery, which is somewhere else in the region that has trees, shrubs, flowers, whatever sort of things you like, you pick it out and the nursery delivers, delivers it to the park and they plant it there. We suggested with these diverse slopes uh, around the park, we could use it as an opportunity to actually have the nursery in the park itself. So we could grow the plants that might go somewhere else in the park along this more urban sort of pathway and use it to always be developing the future of the park next along these paths with different ecologies along the way. You can see it culminating here. So again, you can see this pathway along, around the water, the sports fields, the innovation centers, the two here, as well as you can see, these are clearly much more like nurseries, places to plant trees, flowers, shrubs along this kind of looping uh, sports track and then of course the red path slicing through and how this will be for phase two we're now entering uh, the government after the success of phase one with the red path is very enthused about our ideas of uh, high-tech uh, leisure and so we are proud to show this uh, rendering we showed uh, in the competition versus this photo uh, that we found that someone posted um, uh, of the park itself and its current uh, reality. Moving to kind of, I would actually say the second last part, this idea of formal uh, ratios. How am I doing on time? I'm doing all right, 20 minutes left. I hope this isn't too much, my apologies. It's perfect, you can go on. That's all right, all right. Don't worry. So. It's always good to hear someone else talk. It's, it's weird to give a lecture uh, in your own uh, apartment uh, and, and never know if everyone's falling asleep or whatever, but I'm gonna pretend like everyone's very enthused. So um, in terms of formal ratios, uh, this comes back to a project we did, not, not in the greater Bay Area. So this is in Fujian province, uh, which is basically halfway between uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai along the coast. Ningde 
is the name of the city, which by Chinese standards is a small city. Chinese standards of a small city means there's 3 million people that live there. And it's on the edge of Ningda out in a valley. <clears throat> but before I talk about specifically the project, since we're talking about urban design and cities, I'll, I'll just talk about this notion of constellation urbanization. And I didn't invent this term. Uh, I've heard others talk about it. But the traditional notion of a city is, you know, a place like Beijing or many uh, European cities, there was a wall around it. Within it were streets, buildings, uh, and outside of it, uh, there was either farms or, or nature. Uh, but in reality, whether you look at kind of contemporary China, you, know, you can see urban in terms of constellation, it looks like a, a series of stars dotted that are connected by infrastructure. Or similarly, if you look at Europe and where you guys are now, the kind of classic blue banana uh, going from Italy up to London, you can see the interconnected reality of these dispersed small villages to big cities that are kind of all connected. And the reason I bring that up is for our project. This is actually the, the historic village or series of villages that are adjacent to our site. Uh, so there's a series of kind of, I believe, six small existing villages in this valley, uh, about five kilometers out of the center of Ningde. And the client is a super fascinating client. He's uh, born in Shanghai. <clears throat> He's a uh, kind of a tech uh, engineer guru. He got a patent because he has high spectral imaging technology. All that means is he uses satellites, drones, and cameras inside of greenhouses to look at how plants grow and how the soil works. And with that, he's like a traditional data or, or, or whatever tech company like Facebook or Tencent or Google. He just wants the data. In reality, for his business model, it's not about real estate development. It's not even about selling the food. He wants to gather the data on how plants grow and then sell it to other places. He wants a bit of tourism in the space. So he wants visitors to come and have a health experience with the plants that are grown there. And he'd like uh, a kind of research center. So an office sort of space as well, and then places to eat and hang out. So this is kind of a new idea of rural, this kind of high tech food center and so the reason I talk about that constellation urbanism is, as we all know now, I mean, our food uh, usually is not grown in the city, it's grown outside of it. So these rural places are kind of part of the city, depending on how you define city, but we certainly need the food that's grown in places like this to feed some of us who live in the more urban areas. So we have this uh, lovely series of existing villages. I mean, it's pretty simple. There's a valley, a small river slicing through it a series of villages pushed against the hills. They're lovely, but the client wants to do massive greenhouses uh, because he knows that's the most efficient. And as I mentioned before, before I had the pleasure of moving here uh, to Southeast Asia, I lived in the Netherlands and that's a real picture of their greenhouses just west of Rotterdam where they grow insane amounts of food and do really uh, tremendous kind of food science. But if you've been to that place, it, it's really transformed, to put it in a nice way, the rural communities. They're basically food factories and maybe not such a sense of the tradition of the rural. And, and so we said right away to the client, oh, let's, let's not do that. Uh, that might be the most efficient, but we know you have a lot of respect for the local citizens. Let's, let's find a middle way. And so in a simple way, we just said, instead of one big greenhouse, let's break it into a series of small ones and start to make it feel at least a little uh, referencing the scale of the village that exists. Additionally, we said <clears throat> uh, greenhouses are lovely, uh, but actually if you do the sun angle right, uh, people can live in kind of guest rooms or maybe offices above uh, on the top of the greenhouse and the food can be below. So it becomes kind of a vertical mixed use uh, sort of rural uh, typology. And it starts to break into a, I won't go too much into the design of the project, but a series of greenhouses, uh, community spaces, places to eat and, and uh, buildings. This very initial example of how it relate to the hills in the distance, the existing community, and wanting to have a weird mix of the high tech reality of what are these greenhouses and maybe the, the kind of traditional materiality that could come along uh, the ground floor here with the paving. <clears throat> 
Uh, it's currently under construction and coming out of the ground. This is a photo from about eight months ago. Uh, they've started to fill in the space. Uh, they start to have showcase areas uh, where guests come and they start to talk about how they're observing. If you look close, of course, there's an ability to scan and be aware through the high tech reality that is rural China. There's an ability to gather information and monitor. And speaking of monitoring, the, <clears throat> the cameras are there at all times. Again, inside the greenhouses are cameras on a track. There are drones and satellite imaging is used at all times to monitor what's going on. Further, we did a bit of architecture on this, designing kind of research centers. This is a visitor center with the office space above. Um, that's actually under construction now, uh, kind of layering the showcase in the greenhouse, as well as kind of <clears throat> uh, office and lecture hall above kind of having this sort of scale on the interior. This is a photo from about four months ago uh, of that space under construction. And so coming back again to this notion of how this relates to materiality or, or to a larger uh, sense of our connection to systems. And this, uh, Edo, you'll recognize where I'm going here, thanks to you on this one. Uh, so, you know, talking about what Edo and, and Carlo Ratti and his team and, and others curated in the Shenzhen Biennale, we saw this as an opportunity not that we just design something for the client and build something, but can we reflect on this? Because their call was kind of a contemporary take on the eyes, the eyes of the city, which I mentioned Jane Jacobs before. She also talked about kind of the eyes on the street and things like this, but the eyes that we see the city now are different. <clears throat> we have satellites and drones and, and security cameras and our own eyes and our phones. And so how do we see the city now that we have many different quote, eyes to perceive? And so for that, we suggested a simple installation and well, maybe not so simple. I don't know how you feel about it, Edo. Uh, but uh, the team with Ratsi and them at least seemed to like it. They, they allowed us to build it, trying to express this notion of layers and how one could experience seeing uh, this sort of space in many different ways. So one uh, uh, kind of mirror like space above, so you could look down and see the space almost in plan view, trying to give a hint of what it might look like, let's say from a satellite or from a drone, to really being able to poke your head up uh, within the greenhouses to have a more eye level experience. Uh, of course, it was fun for some of the kids. We even playfully did a little bit of what could it be like if you could see below, which of course, with current technologies, you can be aware of kind of water flows and things like this. And that, which you can see in the distance, so mixed with the kind of very tactile or human experience of the kids seeing the space, there were also a series of illustrations of the reality of what our current technology allows us to see. And by that, what I'm getting at is, We've all been aware of if space feels hot or if there's a breeze or it feels comfortable, but it was always described either in a more poetic way or a very formal sort of geometric way. But we start to be able to measure or, or quantify or visualize heat, uh, underground water, wind, and this allows us to experience uh, our, our human condition in a different way. And so <clears throat> this is an illustration, actually, Edo, you didn't see this one. Um, so to put it in, in, in terms of materiality, what was interesting for us is because the greenhouse, they have dirt and obviously there's dirt outside. So the blur of inside and outside that modernists and, and others have talked about in terms of space, in this case was really real. There is no foundation to the buildings. They have footings, but the in and the out Plants are grown to eat both inside and outside. Uh, there's doors. Oftentimes they're open, sometimes they're not. But the blur of inside and outside is completely real in a place like this. And at the least, everything is transparent. <clears throat> and in that, this is where I make a bit of a jump in terms of urban design. A lot of times urban design, when people talk about street, they talk about it in a sense of proportion. This is a section of a street. They talk about this notion of a proportion of how high the buildings are versus how wide the streets are, which I understand that. I was educated in that way and, and uh, classic urban designers talk about that as a way to kind of read the city or feel it or think of it as a design tool. But I think that notion has really shifted uh, in terms of 
how we start to use spaces in the contemporary world. The technology allows us to see and read spaces differently, not to mention in a more high dense Asian environment often, or even around the world. Uh, the notion of it being defined just by a street and not by underground or by elevated is a bit out of date. So we start to, as it says here, perhaps with technology, we can start to see the invisible. You can be aware of underground spaces below you. In a place like Hong Kong, I can be aware that on the 10th floor of the building next to me, uh, there's a nice cafe. Uh, in a place like Ningde, I can be aware of what's going on with the water underground. Uh, these sort of things add to my way of, quote, seeing the city and not just a proportional formal reality. So you start to feel much more kind of a blur uh, in my mind uh, and a connectedness. <clears throat> Last thing, I think I'm doing all right on time. 10 minutes, all right. Last bit, in that long-winded introduction that Edo was kind enough to read, uh, he mentioned that I've started a, an institute called the Institute for Autonomous Urbanism. What that's getting at is uh, relating back to the first thing I said, uh, talking about this notion of aformal armatures, that there's always been these systems uh, whether natural or infrastructural or governmental or technological that have shaped uh, the way our cities work that are maybe not inherently formal, but have a strong influence on how our cities look and feel. And those technologies and systems are changing. I think us urban designers or citizens are not really aware enough of what the potentials are and implications of these things are. There are discussions of the smart city, but in my mind, I think they're a little limited in terms of raising awareness of what the potentials of such things are. So one, something I'll just call dispersed infrastructure. Infrastructure traditionally was generally provided by the government, <clears throat> was usually pipes, wires, roads, toilet sort of facilities and required uh, a public space that was owned by the government that us citizens were allowed to use. And those lines of infrastructure uh, ran along those uh, government owned spaces. But now infrastructure in many cases is kind of a three way collaboration between me or you, uh, usually some sort of uh, large um, co corporation or company and still the government. And an easy example that's been around for a while, but is growing, photovoltaic cells, solar cells. If I put those on my roof, I own them. I need to connect into the power grid, probably run by a corporation or the government. And I certainly need the government as well. Self-driving cars is certainly things where people are talking about. So we can talk about some of the more emerging things, but even just simply put, even in a really rural, uh, more developing country, phones are dispersed infrastructure. People in Kenya can do banking on their phone, uh, you can, you don't need to go to the library anymore. You have it in your phone. Um, things are really shifting in this idea of dispersed infrastructure. And then another term is what I call autonomous urbanism. And in regards to autonomous urbanism, what I'm speaking to is one autonomy uh, in terms of maybe being a bit more self-sufficient as a, as a citizen or as a community, you have autonomy, but also in terms of autonomous meaning a lot of our infrastructures, whether it's cars or drones, <clears throat> don't actually need us to control them. They're, they're kind of smart enough to do their own things. And what does this mean? So in a place like uh, Asia, you can start to go to factories. You start to see kind of human and robot collaborate in a lot of these factories. The human does one thing, the robot does another. You start to see places uh, like whether this is Amazon or Alibaba, I think this might be Alibaba, uh, but their kind of shipping centers look like kind of like cities. This looks like a block. This is a building that moves. That's a street. And it's kind of a, a moving city uh, inside this kind of factory for a lot of these online shopping hubs. And what I think is more interesting, I was speaking about Ningde and Fujian, which you start to see in places like rural Africa or rural China, instead of maybe needing to build a road or build a train, they can actually use drone systems to provide delivery, whether it's for simple basic delivery, whether it's for emergency vehicles or emergency services, in case someone has an accident, this starts to change things. I spoke about nurseries. 
this is what a nursery looks like. It's a bunch of plants, usually in a big pile, usually in buckets because they'll need to move it. But a lot of those nurseries are not run by man or woman anymore tending to the plants. The machines uh, can move the plants, they can water the plants, and so even our natural habitat is taken care of by machines. So more and more, um, some of you may know this is an old reinterpreted photograph from New York City of a series of construction workers hanging out at Central Park in the background, <clears throat> but it's suggesting that the future of our built cities is going to involve us and the machine systems kind of coexisting together. Le Corbusier very famously said, he didn't say it, well one, he said it in French, he didn't say it in English, uh, but I don't speak French unfortunately, but he basically said uh, a curved street in traditional cities is designed by the, the backside of a donkey kind of wandering through but in our modern cities that we're designing, we can have long, grand, straight roads for men, as he said, or women. But what does that mean for us going forward? If it's not these sort of modernist ideals, if we're collaborating with machines, what does that mean? And then this is a quote, and I still don't know where this quote is from. I've been asking around. I saw this. I believe it was from an exhibition by the London School of Economics, but I love it. The city has always been shaped by its moving parts. One example of this at a large scale is Shenzhen, Hong Kong, uh, the Pearl River Delta itself. <clears throat> Shenzhen, sure, has its special economic zone. It has many things. But one thing it did, it was one of the first ports outside of Japan to start using the shipping container. And by embracing the shipping container, it allowed its ports to function extremely efficiently, allowed it to ship all over the world and was one of the many contributing factors in why Shenzhen in this region has really boomed. So again, a small scale technology, just the simple idea of a standard shipping container has transformed many of our urban waterfronts and our ports. Another example, and yeah, you can see how Shenzhen on the right uh, 45 years ago and how it looks on the left. But maybe a better example is this is a, a old drawing from someone in a balloon of Manhattan. This is Manhattan, about 1870, so just before cars and elevators were uh, invented. And it looked like what it used to be called. It looked like New Amsterdam. This looks like Europe. The tallest structures are churches or maybe the top of a bridge. And most of the buildings are you know, three to six stories tall. But then someone invented an elevator. Someone invented the car. We started to have wider streets, freeways, skyscrapers could happen. Manhattan looks completely different now and our modern cities, whether here in Asia or all over the world, feel completely different because of two simple technological innovations that move, reshaped our cities. So this is a joke. I'm guessing a lot of you don't know this, but there was a movie called Back to the Future uh, where they joked, uh, where we're going, we don't need any roads. And to illustrate that in a very, again, I've talked about spatial sort of realities. So the thing I did, this was with students back when I used to teach in the Netherlands in uh, Tilburg and looking at a city called Eindhoven, which I think the Dutch would say is maybe the Shenzhen or the Silicon Valley of the Netherlands, but certainly as a tech center. It's got a traditional center of the city. We just started speculating on what that could mean if they start to have self-driving cars. If you have self-driving cars, you could certainly imagine a reality where you don't need to let cars on every single little road uh, that you have in a traditional city. You could pick it up like a taxi or like a bus on the main roads and allow these other streets. Suddenly you have all these streets available <clears throat> that no longer need to be for car parking or driving. What do you do with those streets? In a very modest, simple street like this one in Eindhoven, forgive the Dutch on the top left, the consequences for the street is what it says. So if you no longer need uh, car parking, And do all this space. If you know about city given over to streets. So suddenly, what if cities could rethink 20% or so and start to allow us citizens to use it different just because self-driving cars could change the way we use our cities? What could those streets feel like? I have no idea. This is one of my students playing around uh, about seven years ago, which I quite like as a reference could be a place to grow food could be a play space could be any sort of things 
that this kind of citizen streets within the village was something that was speculated on this possibility of what can come from dispersed infrastructure and a notion of autonomous urbanism. And with that, I believe that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to hang out and answer any and all. Wow, I'm almost exactly an hour and a half. I did very good. I'm proud of myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Perfect on time. I, uh, it was like uh, bombing me in a lot of concepts. I, I, I think I have like 1,000 questions for you. But uh, uh, no, first of all, I'd like to really to thank you because you, you combine a lot of, of your project and design and concepts. And uh, uh, this is exactly what we wanted for our lecture for students that are approaching urban design. And they are also full of questions because they are in the middle exactly of this transition between a traditional way of teaching urban design based on form and you speculating on something more and moving forward on other concepts. So it's really relevant. But before mine and maybe Professor Bertha question, I think we have a lot of, uh, we have now 60 <laughs> person connect. This so much larger than our classroom. This is uh, the, the, the surprises from the, COVID-19 that led us to be connected with more people without being in the same room. Uh, but I would like first to thank for the, from the audience, I see many of our friends uh, and, uh, and our students connected. If they have any question, I, I leave the ground first for them. And then we can continue to have a, this, a round table discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much also from my side. It has been a really a stunning lecture. I'm really, I'm really impressed by the quality of the projects that you just shown. Uh, I just would like to say that uh, I propose uh, uh, for the question and answer uh, that uh, everyone interested can write his one or her question directly in the chat, or maybe if uh, he wants to to ask the question directly, we can book uh, the, the possibility of opening the microphone. Okay. Okay. If there is any, okay, okay, you mute. Okay, perfect. Okay. <clears throat> uh, shall I, I read it and then I'll answer it? Does that sound good? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the excellent lecture. According to the projects introduced, I have a question about the design of public space. What's the difference between public space, design of a village and an urban area? Are the design proposals and orientations from different aspects? One very well worded question. You mean, I'm going to assume I'm kind of selling your name, saying your name, right? My apologies. Uh, <sighs> Uh, great question. Um, yeah. I mean, in some ways, they are the same. Uh, you're taking uh, the human condition and you're applying it to the landscape or earth. So there is a commonality uh, there between something more village and more urban. <clears throat> uh, but of course, as I kind of alluded to, uh, there's a big difference in terms of, I mean, if you're talking urban, especially in, in a sense like Guangzhou, or, or Asia, I mean, those urban conditions can be extraordinarily urban. Uh, so the notion of uh, public space becomes a, a blur of what's inside of a building and out. And I think you need to take that more into account when you're an urban system. So how do those infrastructure networks and spaces that are connected to them, how are they a part of public space? Whereas obviously in your, if you're in the rural, I think there's a big uh, necessity to be aware of the natural uh, networks and be more keenly aware. Um, and then there's just, of course, a massive difference is just the number of people uh, in an urban condition, especially in an in Asian city, the number of people that will use a space is incredibly intense. So the kind of materiality and, and sort of structures you're going to use to make sure that that can be walked on or driven on repeatedly needs to be a completely different character. And I'd say another difference is not just people, but I also mentioned a bit but to, to illustrate is 
the difference between the times of the day and how it's used in an urban area. <clears throat> if it's lunch, if it's the end of the day, if it's the weekend, if it's a festival. Uh, in urban areas, those streets and parks can just be people just right next to each other. Uh, I know we're not supposed to say that during COVID, uh, but yeah, you can be pretty tightly packed. Whereas in rural, there's always a greater sense of space. So in some ways, there's no difference. Uh, and in other, it's just, it's, it's a bit of a scale uh, issue in terms of number of people and dimensions. And in another way, it's one is maybe more associated with urban systems and infrastructures. And the other one is maybe more connected to natural systems uh, such as ecology or food system. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I just would like uh, to add a couple of considerations, uh, especially directed to our students, but I mean, for everyone. Um, I think that among the many lessons that we can learn from this presentation, there are two very relevant cases for what we are doing in our course. Uh, the first one uh, is that possibility that you've shown, in, I think in almost all your projects, of, of using all, the, all those parts of the city that are normally hidden and treated like simple plants that cannot be seen by normal people as opportunities, as occasion to create public spaces. Uh, normally in Italy, we use an expression which is uh, uh, the, the belly of the city, which means all, all, the, all those parts that must be hidden, that are too ugly to be seen, like sewage plants, like uh, uh, energy generation plants uh, and so on. And uh, what is very interesting in your project is that you are using, uh, in many cases, like uh, the problem of the wood waste, the problem of the greenhouses, the problem of the sewage system in, uh, in the coastlines, and so on. You are using all those spaces, all those technical parts of the city, as opportunities to create beautiful and stunning places. This is a very, uh, a very great lesson, in, in my opinion. And the second one, which is uh, already very interesting, is that uh, idea that you just uh, did you explain very well of the layering of the public space. Because normally, when we think of the public space, we think of something which is bidimensional, which means which is flat, uh, a square, a garden, and so on. But actually, in many cases, especially in Asian cities, and especially in your city, because Hong Kong is really a layered and stacked city, um, normally public space is, is, is three-dimensional, it's something that grows also in eight and not just in two dimensions. And, uh, and, and all, this is also important because you also explained that normally this uh, boundary line between what we call uh, public and what we call private is not a well-defined boundary line, but this something blurred, normally the differences between what is public and what is private is not that easy to be recognized. So maybe it is more interesting to think to the city more in terms of walkability, of possibility of using the space and not in terms of property. I'll say, I'll say one other thing, because I'm again reminded I'm speaking with Italians. Because <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mentioned Noli and then I talk about Asia, blah, blah, blah. But when I talk about um, dispersed infrastructure and uh, autonomous and all that, I mean, the work of Secchi and his writing on the Chita Diffusa or Diffuse City, uh, wildly influential <clears throat> on some of my thinking. And uh, if the students are interested in some of that, that sort of discourse, his works there and his ideas and how it relates to, you know, the area uh, outside of Venice, I think is, uh, anything I'm talking about is in no way very new. It's building on others. So obviously this is academia, so we should be aware of where those roots are and where those influences. But yeah, Secchi's work is, at least for me, um, very influential in how I start to think about the notion of the city. But it looks like we have a, another yep. question. It yep. starts with a weird question. Great. <laughs> Hi, maybe it's a weird question, but what do you think about a vision of a city of the future, which take advantage of alternative viability system in air and develop in this way, other ground level. What are the possible benefits in your opinion? Yeah, um, I think 
that's absolutely uh, possible. Um, and, and again, I'll, I'll reference not, not my work, uh, but some work that's happened here in, in Asia. It was speculative um, <clears throat> by an office called Urbanus, uh, which is based in, in Shenzhen and quite influential. Uh, there's some of these um, urban villages uh, within Shenzhen that maybe want to be retained, but maybe there's an idea since they're only 10 stories tall, uh, there might be an idea to really build another layer of the city above it, a kind of mega structure on top. I believe this is what you're getting at, to build space above the city. I hope that's what you mean. Um, I certainly think that's one been done in some places to retain uh, the lower space and to build above. Uh, there's also a version of that, especially in places uh, like here in, in Hong Kong and Shenzhen and Guangzhou, where it gets very hot. Um, it can be very beneficial to create a space above. Uh, that's a building that creates shade for space below to make the natural or outdoor environment much more uh, hospitable or able to be uh, used. Because for six to seven months of the year, the this climate can be pretty warm uh, during the day and maybe not the easiest space. So the potential of using air rights to develop and to develop a, a layered set of grounds, one is kind of happening and two, I think it's gonna come more and more. And I think it's an interesting question because the idea of who develops the air above is uh, also, uh, well, if you grew up in a capitalist society like I did is always an interesting question uh, of, of things of these regards. I'll just keep reading the questions. Is that all right? Mauro, you jumped in with a great answer. I don't need to talk the whole bloody time. Oh, Sorry, man. I'll read for you, Jason, if you want. You, you read? All right, all right, all right, all right. I'll, I'll try like, to be a TV presenter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he's asking us, thank you for the lecture. It is actually possible to reduce the distance between urban and rural with intervention on public space in China. It is culturally difficult to be able to think and over of an organization that does not cancel the rural part, but includes it. And it's a question that is also relevant with our course that we, uh, you know, our competition on Lishui that uh, was promoting urbanization without destroying the landscape. So again, it's still opposites that needs to reframe our design too. I think that you are a master of this. Uh, I wouldn't use the word master, but that's nice of you to say. Uh, certainly, for you. You're, you're, <laughs> we have to, to start to do that. It sounds. <laughs> you're you're very kind. I teach in a master's program. Um, anyway, um, but I know your your project in Lishui. And to be honest, we I don't know if you saw that, Edo. We got shortlisted for a somewhat similar sort of rural question outside of Chengdu. Yeah, so in Sichuan. Uh, not quite as prestigious as the one you got, uh, but we're, we're still pretty happy to get selected. <laughs> um, but I think it's a great question and becomes more and more of a common question, not just, not just in Asia, but everywhere. Uh, again, growing up where I did, I, I grew up in the rural. In reality, <clears throat> the urban dramatically affected uh, my life, for better or worse. Uh, and so how to preserve or, or find a balance... That's always just really tricky. I have to say for me, maybe because I grew up in, in the, the, the US version of the rural, um, which is pretty urban. Uh, you know, it looks like a suburb, uh, even though it was a small town. But I don't have a very, uh, I don't have a very fixed definition of rural, meaning that it, you know, maybe for some people that means a dirt road and maybe a stone building. and uh, everyone grows which is a bit more uh, uh, appreciated than maybe I did. Uh, and not to dismiss that, but my notion of rural is, is much more blurred and, and much more complex. And there I'll tell, I'll tell another story. I seem to have time. Uh, my old boss in the Netherlands, he's Japanese. This is not about rural, but I think it relates. <clears throat> Hiroki always talked about his version of living was he lived in the Netherlands, but he's Japanese. He's got a Japanese wife. He worked in an international office where he had to speak English. He liked fish a lot because he's Japanese and the Dutch have fish. So he could say all the Dutch words for fish. And his daughters spoke fluent Dutch. And at night, they watched Japanese TV. 
So his version of like what was his life was not strictly place-based, it was really interconnected. And so again, this notion of rural gets tricky uh, in terms of how you, you define rural. Uh, but what I do think in terms of how to, how to find a potential in that, I think, I think space like, especially a place like China or Asia has the benefit of seeing the mistakes uh, of places like we did in the United States where we, um, or in the Netherlands, like I mentioned, where maybe we just re relied too much on kind of capitalism and, and a machine idea of, of how to extract as many things as possible and we maybe didn't respect the heritage. Uh, China's got a much, much, much longer heritage than at least uh, the, the contemporary notion of the United States ignoring the Native American uh, reality. So the potential of, of China to find a balance that both leverages uh, the extreme uh, excitement that comes with the technology and others is, is there. And then I'll, I'll advertise for a book that I have nothing to do with that I'm in the middle of that a bunch of my friends have been, oh, is the camera not gonna do it? Bloody camera. No, you can, you can keep it in front of you, in front of your- oh, yeah, there you go, you know yeah. the trick. I gotta do that. Yeah. But it's, uh, blockchain chicken farm. it's called blockchain, blockchain Chicken Farm and Other Stories of Tech in China's Countryside by Zhao Wei Wang. Uh, it's available on almost all publishing sites. Uh, I know a lot of my friends who are interested in this notion of rural and technology and what's starting to happen in Asia are, are quite intrigued by this book. <clears throat> But I guess after that long-winded answer of stories of the Netherlands, uh, Ohio, uh, Japan, um, what I think is the, the real potential is if we use technology intelligently to help us be more respectful of nature and not let, let's say, our, our man-made desires uh, kind of conquer uh, the natural or the rural habitat, there's a way to still grow food, uh, allow people to be connected, maintain an existing sort of culture and heritage, but still allow it to evolve and change uh, to allow for contemporary ideas of what is rural. Because China of all places is extremely exciting uh, the way the rural is, is transforming um, in terms of what it means and many nice projects. And, and if you don't know who, uh, I can advertise another book, but if you don't know, yeah, I'll stop. But if you don't know who Oning is, I would I would look at his Bishan project also as a reference. But that's I'm, I'm advertising for others. <clears throat> but uh, good question, thank you. Okay, so I continue yeah. because uh, this one of our students, Chong Wang, is uh, asking. Uh, of course, thank you for the lecture. Construction construction of infrastructure often has a great influence on the villagers' lifestyle, but it's usually considered as a passive process for villagers to adjust to, to the change brought by the infrastructure. That is the main topic of our course, so it's really, so please, <laughs> good advice. So what do you think about the effect of infrastructure, infrastructure in rural space? Yeah, I mean, not just in rural. I mean, that's also really overlooked everywhere. We forget because uh, we dig up a road and we put stuff underneath it and we forget that that messes up drainage, uh, worms, uh, really important things happen underground roots. And, and when we put in kind of traditional infrastructure, pipes and wires and roads, that, that really messes that up. Uh, so it's in incredibly intrusive. You put in foundations of buildings, forget infrastructure, that really, really is detrimental to a place. So the potential in the rural uh, and in this infrastructure that we could think of that I'm playing around with, this idea of dispersed infrastructure, and you could say it relates a bit to the modernist idea of, you know, PLOT, kind of could the building sit a bit lighter on the landscape? But you can push that even further. Can the infrastructure sit even lighter if we rely on yeah, to put simply, you know, self-driving cars could actually make our roads kind of look like train tracks. They could have just very narrow places for the cars to drive on and the rest could all be flowers if you want or water. So infrastructure is always intrusive. Um, 
but the potential of it, it shifting is really there. And I mean, the easiest example is before, you know, you, you needed wires in the ground to get a phone and then it connected in your building. And now I live in the center of Hong Kong and my internet provider was just like, <clears throat> it's too tough for us to put new wires in your building. We're just going to give you a 5G network and stick it by the window. So, you know, even they don't, uh, even the, t the telephone company doesn't want to mess with wires anymore. So I think, yeah, infrastructure is incredibly damaging. Um, it's also incredibly helpful and allows us to go to the toilet, uh, drink water, be able to drive to go see our, our grandma who maybe lives in the town adjacent. Uh, so it's always a balance in terms of that um, quality it provides in terms of, let's say, culture and the damage it, it, it occurs in terms of environment. And finding a balance in that is... And um, is that a decent enough answer? I always feel like I don't answer questions well. Yeah, okay. Mauro? Yes. Um, what is the next question? Uh, Yan. Yeah, Hao Yan Chen. Okay, so the question is, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I'm curious about the layered seat concept of Hong Kong once, and there is an impressive pedestrian system. But when we want to copy it to other cities, there, is, there can be some problem. People are not willing to climb the pedestrian bridge. Would you please talk more about experiences and skills to design a vertical city? <laughs> this is a great question. Um, in Hong Kong, um, we're very willing to climb uh, those uh, stairs uh, and, and those elements because it's just, one, the city's got a lot of topography which is different than most Chinese cities, except uh, maybe Chongqing. So inherently, you have to go up the hill in, in most of the city. I happen to live in Kowloon, which is pretty flat. The rest of the city is usually shoved against a hill. So you always need to climb a hill. So that is part of uh, the reality that just makes it that citizens are just aware of that. Reminds me of when I lived in San Francisco. There were just hills all the time. And so the idea of going upstairs doesn't maybe even bother you because you go up the stairs and then you walk across an elevated path and through a shopping mall. And in reality, then you hit the street you want to get to because the hill, while you were going flat, the hill came up to you. So one, there's a cultural reality. But then also in a place like Hong Kong, because it's so common, there's a lot of escalators. Uh, so that also really helps. Um, but it's... The good thing about the layering is there, uh, but the bad thing is also the other reason people in Hong Kong are willing to do it is it was really, the city was really built in this kind of modernist or 60s, 70s, 80s engineering attitude that prioritized the car. And so if I just want to walk across the city in a lot of it, like central, I can't. I have to go up the staircase and that's terrible. I mean, it's cool for us urban designers in terms of form that we get a layered city but it's totally annoying to walk across some Hong Kong neighborhoods. Like even me, uh, again, I live in Kowloon. There's, there's supposedly a freeway that cuts through a park that I'm not allowed to kind of walk across, but actually there's a traffic light there. Cars stop, but I'm not allowed to walk there, at least not legally. But there's still a hostility towards pedestrians in this city. And so I think the challenge is, I mean, the short answer, I'll again be the, the technology guy. The escalator, or like I showed in that in that project in Tianhai, uh, how do you make this moment when you go up not feel like oh I gotta go up the stairs, but make it so it feels like a bit of an experience, or it's just a bit easier in terms of your reality, whether that's a ramp or something else. Make it something enjoyable. Most pedestrian bridges and their stairs are not well designed, and they're very functional. So as an urban designer, can you make that experience enjoyable? And can you make it not just a pedestrian bridge that feels like, you know, because you can talk about it in the Hong Kong way, but like I was to a lot of, if you want to say Russian or post-Soviet cities, there's a lot of times you have to go under the road, which in their case also can make sense because in a lot of Russian realities, it's really cold uh, for six months. So it's actually kind of nice to go underground because it's warmer in the winter but it's also really insulting to the pedestrian. 
that you feel like you are literally told you're not as important, you go under the car has priority. And so how do we find these sort of flows and movements so it becomes a respect for the car uh, and it's reality that we need people to be delivered and we need food and goods delivered by some of their services. But in the end, it is for us humans and animals uh, important that we can move in the city and, and to how to design those interfaces or changes in topography are key. I mean, in, in Hong Kong, there's just, there's escalators everywhere. If you've been here, you've seen the escalators that just go up the hill for like uh, three kilometers, which for better or worse is one of my favorite pieces of infrastructure in the world. But yeah, uh, it's not easy. And I think that's another fun thing in Asia. You start to see better and better examples of how it can work. I suggest to everyone which is interested in this, uh, in this problem of the vertical growth of the public space in the super dense city to take a look to a beautiful book, which is called, which is titled um, Cities Without Ground. And it is a guide, a guide of Hong Kong, <laughs> you know it, of course. And it's a book about Hong Kong, basically. And it dissects the city of Hong Kong, uh, showing how the you cannot speak of, of a real ground of Hong Kong because there are multiple grounds that are stacked one over each other. Yeah. Okay, um, next question is, thank you for the excellent lecture. No, sorry, thanks, Professor. The combination of different types of sports and behavior in one area seems to be very interesting, but a little perplexed. So maybe there are some basic design principles of it. <clears throat> okay, this is a legitimately great question. Um, when we do our little playful design thing where we say we're going to mix running and, and all of this, uh, we're being provocative. Uh, one, we did it in the competition to get attention. Um, the client, to be very clear, um, the, the first government official in Guangming loved it. <clears throat> then that government official uh, shifted to another part of China. Let's say it that way. Um, and then a new government official came in. They hated it. And then our, our, our red bridge opened and uh, it was a success. Now they think our, our weird uh, sport ideas are great. So <clears throat> uh, we're going to have to figure out what it means. But what I would say, not just in terms of uh, that Guangming project, but also in Shenzhen Bay, uh, we talked about it, and I didn't mention it so much in here, I kind of alluded to these plazas. But there's a bit of, uh, let's say, programming. And again, you know, our phones, which I love how it goes invisible, our phones, it's so cool, it's feel, like <laughs> feel like a vampire. Um, <clears throat> our, our, uh, our phones and, and the digital technology can allow a uh, a programming of these spaces. So to be aware that uh, during, and, and a lot of obviously sports fields in China or many other places around the world already have this. You kind of know uh, my, my uh, gym club has the right to play basketball from seven at night until nine at night. <clears throat> and then another one has it at another time. So if you have this sort of complex reality of, of how these spaces could be layered and used, I think the digital is going to have to help us program it and sort it. But it was also kind of done as a bit of a provocation of not assuming that uh, we di design a basketball court and it remains that way forever. Like maybe in, I mean, in, in China, uh, you guys aren't supposed to play basketball anymore, right? She said you guys should all play football. So, you know, uh, sports trends change. And, and so we wanted to make the field basically a bit like a plaza it could be reinterpreted. And to be honest, it's a bit of chaos in, in terms of how we'll do it. I would also say if you look at a lot of sports fields and there's some beautiful graphic design folks that have done it, a lot of sports fields have the traces of how you play tennis on it, how you play basketball on it, how you play other sports on it. And depending on which thing you're doing, you're like, oh, basketball, that means I follow the red lines. Oh, it's tennis, I follow the green lines. And so a lot of it actually already exists we're playing with it a bit further. But the real answer is we're going to have to figure it out in a much more serious way uh, in the next few months because they want phase two of the park open <laughs> by next spring festival. So uh, <clears throat> ask me in about four months, I'll have a better answer. But yeah, we're uh, being provocative. <clears throat> okay, so there is a 
uh, our last, no, it is not the last question because a new one <laughs> just appeared. Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. It seems a trend to increase public infrastructure to improve livelihoods in the recent future. However, as you mentioned, the boulevards may reduce in the city thanks to the development of autonomous vehicles. What do you think about the contradiction? How will the roads transform itself? Again, good question. And it's a bit speculative, <clears throat> but the way I think of roads is think of it, uh, think of it like a river. Uh, when it's raining or when it's the rainy season, that river is much higher, it's much more filled with water and you need all of the, the bank of the river to allow the water to move, whether in a natural system or in an urban reality. And we've designed our city streets to only handle the maximum time. And when there's not maximum on a Sunday at four in the morning, it's sitting there empty. So I think there's a potential again in this idea of dynamic <clears throat> that can we start to think of how our streets are programmed differently uh, and used differently uh, on a Monday at 9 a.m. versus a Friday at 10 p.m. or during a festival and these sort of things, which already start to happen. And so I think that's coming more and more. There's something called placemaking. Maybe you guys know that. That movement certainly pushes this idea of programming and how people can use streets in different ways. Again, I'll be the technology guy. I think, I think the, the ability of uh, technology to allow us to maybe make uh, literally benches, if trees are in pots, uh, all these things can move. And, and you know, our streets could be really dynamic. Now when we, when we change a street, we as humans have to push something in the way, but I think it could really be much more free flowing and moving. And to give the easy, more straightforward answer, you haven't seen it as much uh, in mainland and zero in Hong Kong, unfortunately. But in a lot of parts of the world, thanks to the virus, they've realized they need to let restaurants and bars use the sidewalk, use the parking, and sometimes they just close the street to cars. And I think this, in, in some cultures in the world, this has been transformative because I think a lot of streets will never be the same uh, because the government has realized we don't need it to be for cars all the time. And so is there a simple answer uh, to, to what you're asking? No, uh, but I do think this is coming more and more as kind of the awareness of systems gets more, the suspicion of cars gets more and uh, governments and, and others get more savvy and, and individuals about the potential of streets. And if you don't know what uh, Barcelona is do doing with their super blocks, uh, I would at least have a look at that. That's maybe the best case study these days about how to reinterpret our streets in a number of ways. Okay, there is another question, which is, sorry. Um, thank you, Professor. <clears throat> thank you, Professor, for your lecture. I have a question about the integration concept in programming. The integration you made in the Guangming Hongqiao Park are innovative and interesting. And can you explain more details about the necessity of integration, park sports and business center? How can we find innovative but also reasonable integration programming in a more general way? The description where there's no strict requirements come from clients and the government. <laughs> Good question. And, and I didn't even say the proper name, but you wrote the proper name, so appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, is, is a necessity of the integration of, of innovation. As you say, it's, it's at least uh, interesting, but is it really um, reasonable? I guess, one, it's not necessary. I mean, the traditional idea of parks and nature and sports fields is great. We don't need to be innovative. Uh, they work just fine. Um, but our, our desire uh, for this innovation or slightly different model is again to, to increase the experience of, of leisure or nature uh, by having a, a kind of research and technology uh, center within the park. We hope people are more aware of the reality of the systems of a park. So also that means someone is sitting in that R&D center that knows probably more about plants and animals than they do. 
So it's like a help center to ask about nature, whether it's bird habitats or tree habitats or how the water moves. So we think that's an advantage that it gives the, the park user uh, a different uh, experience. In terms of this more sport oriented thing, I guess I just see it as it's innovation actually just for the sake of innovation, uh, the same as you do it in business. Uh, one thing we talked about uh, more, the, more the Europeans, the Dutch pointed it out nicely, is talking about innovation in sports. They're like, hey, look at the World Cup every and Euro Cup. Every two years, there's a new football, there's new shoes. There's technology all the time in sports. It's constant. Um, Lola also worked for Adidas, uh, so they, they have a bit more of an association uh, with sports tech. But this idea of innovation uh, is also good, not just in terms of for the sake of it, but if we can be more creative in how to get uh, our urban citizens to want to exercise, to want to be aware of their body, to be more healthy, these technology systems in terms of can help people engage more engaged with their fellow citizens and communities. So it's not only innovation for the sake of innovation. We think it's, it's a way to help people uh, make our cities better, enjoy yourselves, get to know each other, be more active, be more healthy, spend more time family and not working, these sort of ideas. Um, thank you so much, Jason. <laughs> we, we can invite you if you want as a, uh, to participate more in our course because I'm sure that uh, your the, our students is going to have more and more and more questions but definitely we are going to invite you for the final review it's a very nice occasion for uh, a discussion on their project so they can feel the pressure to to design much better uh, no uh, if there are no more questions i would like to raise one to you uh, first of all the, the, your lecture inspired me a lot many discussion that we already had in the past are regarding many, many aspects of what you talk about. And um, I try to make one question, but it's part of two in some ways. That is, a, because you speak a lot about what can we can say as a starting point of a contingency, we have artificial elements and natural elements that are in some way seem separated, but they are not so well analyzed, even by the expert or even by the, who is a, let's say, a task to design or transform itself. And then there is another concept that is much blurry in these two, that is man-made part, you know, where the man-made intervention. And uh, I, I'm, I'm happy because you uh, show us your project as man-made intervention. We were never saying that you were preserving, that you were selecting, uh, transcaling, uh, making a perspective. So it was a, an operation bank by man-made. And it seems a lot of, let's say, a way of being even an engineering of the 19th century, no, that uh, do something. But the other side is that at the end, you arrive always to speak about be within an a formal, so raising the formal aspect of that. That seems a contraposition, but I know you very well and I understand what, the, what is your point. So my question is uh, how you combine these man-made operations so doing without being formal, but trying to be a formal, so how you change your approach to that. So which, what kind of tools during your practice you have to change to get this a formal, let's say, attitude? It's a, it's a tricky question, I know, but it's what to conclude the, 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 the morning. So it's, it's for you, yeah. no problem. No, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, that's, you could argue basically that's what my bloody PhD is about. So you should be my thesis advisor. You, you'd get along very well. <clears throat> That's, that's the stuff they like to ask me all the time. Um, in terms of the tools, because I like that you, you framed it uh, in that way, kind of more specifically, how do I do it? And one, I just said the word I, uh, it's not really me. Obviously we do this as a team. No, but it has to be said, yeah. Uh, but one thing I'll say is I, despite talking about technology, I am not high tech. I, I use trace paper most of the time and a pen and you know we're not like a big uh, gis parametric uh, rhino whatever you know we use those tools uh but we don't 
Uh, we're not like scripting everything or whatever. And there's nothing against that stuff. But what I would say getting at the formal question is we try not to start with a formal idea. So it doesn't start with, uh, it doesn't start with a square or a circle or, or, or a, a street. <clears throat> it tries and we struggle, uh, me maybe more than most, to not make those assumptions about the traditional form. And, and to try and question, why, just because it's always been, been built like that, why do we need to build it like that? You know, just like that, you know, this stupid red path, uh, lovely red path uh, in the background. It started with this joke of what if we, <laughs> what if we built a ramp to the top of the hill? And then I think one, one of us was like, wait, wh what if we did? <laughs> like, it was really a joke. You know, like, what if grandpa could go to the top of the hill in his wheelchair? Wouldn't that be cool? And then someone said, yeah, but we, we could do that. And then so it, it kind of starts off on, on kind of accidents um, or just asking the right questions or forgetting the right assumptions. And on that, then again, I'll quote my old Japanese boss, Hiroki. I always love what he said. He always said when he sits down to sketch, he dreams of being like his young daughters who don't know anything about architecture or cities. And his example is always, you know, when they draw a house and they put the chimney on it, the chimney isn't vertical. It's, it's, it's at 45 degrees because they don't know. And, and so he tries to, when he draws, just attempts to erase his knowledge. And, and then in another way, I think related, but it's a bit more professional is, I mean, Rem Koolhaas and many are notorious and I try, I'm not claiming I'm OMA, uh, but I would say I've learned from at least what they say. And I think they do is get a bunch of young people with crazy ideas, tell them to be crazy. <clears throat> and then I, as the editor, Koolhaas's thing, not mine, I'm just quoting him, I guess would be appropriate since we're talking about editors is I, as the editor, pick and choose the most interesting because maybe I know more, but the junior staff maybe has better ideas, maybe 90% are terrible, but occasionally the best ideas come from them not knowing, oh man, that's really tough. You know, we can't make that. Or sometimes you go, oh, that intern's idea and that project leader's idea, if you smash them together, then you can do this. And it happens like that. So in some ways, ignorance, or, or, or being foolish or dreaming uh, combined with a bit of, wait, 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 that makes me realize my assumptions are wrong can be the best, uh, best way forward. So it's tricking yourself. So again, in terms of techniques, <clears throat> a lot of architects really say, oh, you got to build models or some people are really into parametric stuff or some people are really into sketching or, or whatever. I like to play around with every technique out of the habit. Um, uh, because that way I don't have a standard way of approaching it. But that's for me. I have nothing against the others who, there's some people who only work with models who make absolutely genius stuff. Uh, but for me, uh, being a little uncomfortable or a little confused is sometimes the best way to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. It's exactly uh, what I was expecting in order to <laughs> give to the students these uh, non-comfortable zone that there is no one line of thoughts one book one, uh, i would like to uh, ask the students to think about some of the concepts raised from this lecture because there is a composition of that selection or editing no even your project is an editing way of selecting testing and, and all the time we said to you during our lecture to going back and again and restarting to reframe is exactly the process that this morning, Jason show us in his practice. So even if he's much, he's not as young as you, he's doing the same again and again and again, testing and experimenting. And you said the ignorance, confused, foolish, uh, seems negative <laughs> adjective or attitudes in our world that wants to be more like machines and be straightforward for everything, uh, while there is still a stance for no, for testing and and uh, and moving up muddy surface that at the same time can be experimental. I don't know, uh, Mauro, what do you think about? Uh, but uh, uh, I think that I would like, uh, yeah, I think that I would like to 
to keep Jason here for all day long, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I don't want to waste your time. Uh, I asked the audience if they have any any other questions. Uh, so I think that we, we could uh, save some minutes again. And uh, waiting for, for the very last question, I would like to thank so much Jason Fielder for, for this stunning lecture. It has been uh, a really important moment, in my opinion, for our students, because uh, we are trying to to frame this uh, quite uh, sleepy argument, which is uh, urban design. Uh, we, we started uh, to to explain our students that uh, actually we, we cannot say uh, in just one way what is urban design. There are possibly many definitions, many interpretations. And uh, I think that today you gave us a very, a very interesting and uh, very precious interpretation of what, what our work is. Thank so thank you so much for, for, this, for this lesson. And uh, I hope to see you again uh, in person this time, because the last time we win. Oh, there is... Oh, okay, no, it is not... Uh, no, that's me. No. That's oh, me. no, that's you. Uh, <laughs> I'll say just... Yeah, 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 it's me. It's me thanking everyone else. Um, all I wanted to say is the last thing. I mean, uh, you guys obviously come to Asia a lot when things open up. I hope we can meet. Uh, our office is in the Venice Biennale. Uh, so yeah. I'm really, I like coming to Italy no matter what. <clears throat> uh, so I'm hoping that gives me an excuse that I don't need. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to come and see you there or we see each other somewhere in between. Uh, but thanks again. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our little team participated in the Chinese Pavilion for the Venice Biennale, so we hope at least to meet in Venice. We can all meet in Hong Kong or, or, or for a beer at least. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I was really happy about that. Uh, and uh, let's be in touch and uh, definitely uh, give you more let's say details for the final reviews that will be around June uh, with the students that, that will be big round table because they are students at South China University of Technology with professors both from Italy or from China sure. and uh, some inviting experts that can come. I think it will be a nice occasion for discussion. That'd be great. Hey. Thank I'll you all. Say, uh, see you and uh, <laughs> ciao. ciao Thank you all. And I, I would like to remind to the audience and to all the people interested that next week, always on Wednesday, always at, uh, at uh, three o'clock uh, GMT plus eight, we will have William T. Junior, which is the owner of uh, William WTA Architecture and Design, a very interesting studio based in Manila, and a friend of mine and uh, Jason. And uh, so we will wait you for, for the next for the next lecture. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, I propose to to switch off the the connection for ten minutes, and uh, maybe we could uh, we could yeah we could connect again maybe with your class soon, you know, with uh, not mine uh, with, with our yes. yeah with our students. Okay. So I think it, now it is uh, uh, for us. 10, 16, I think that in 15 minutes, 10.30, uh, we will come back, okay? Thank you also for all the big audience Thanks. that was with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.